Welcome, welcome, welcome to this whole life action hour. So glad you're here. This is Ocean Robbins. And we are here to talk today about stress and about stress reduction and about peace and ease and joy and relaxation. You know, stress is a natural bodily response to certain conditions and healthy stress can be a healthy response to certain things that happen in life. Um, but in the modern world, most of us are living in states of chronic stress that can wreak havoc. It can wreak havoc on your health, on your well-being, even on your immune system. In this action hour, we're going to look at lifestyle hacks and simple practices for getting you out of fight or flight, for turning down the stress, and for opening to more peace, more centeredness, more purpose, more presence, more joy. And we have the perfect person to share in that conversation with my dear friend, the brilliant Dr. Pedram Shojai. He's the founder of Well.org, New York Times bestselling author of many books, including The Urban Monk, Rise and Shine, The Art of Stopping Time, and Inner Alchemy. He's the producer and director of award-winning films like Vitality, Origins, and Prosperity. And he's produced several documentary series, including Interconnected, Gateway to Health, and the upcoming series, Exhausted. In his spare time, Pedram is also a Taoist abbot, a doctor of oriental medicine, a kung fu world tra traveler, a fierce global green warrior, an avid backpacker, a devout alchemist, a qigong master, and an old school Jedi, Jedi biohacker working to preserve our natural world and wake all of us up to our full potential. He's also a father, runs a company or maybe multiple companies, a podcaster, and I'm honored to say a friend. Uh, Pedram, thanks so much for being with us. Great to be with you as always. Nice to see you. All righty. Well, let's just jump in. Um, I have a few questions and then we have a lot of questions from our whole Life Club membership community. Um, so first, I just want to ask you, what is it about the modern world that has created so much unhealthy stress? Can you kind of break that down for us? Yeah, I mean, it's a busy place, ain't it? There's a lot of things. I mean, our primitive circuitry, if you will, is designed around survival, right? So it's about shelter, food, staying warm, being, you know, feeling safe, if you will. And yeah. those things in a natural setting, I've done a lot of wilderness survival training in Africa and things. I mean, it's, you know, it's about the basics. It's about, you know, finding the food and staying warm. Beyond that, I mean, it's all it's all gray area, right? And we live in a place where food is abundant, but it's calorically rich, nutritionally, you know, deplete and all the things that you talk about um, all the time. So your people know all this, the yeah. food sucks. And the world out there is crazy. I mean, look, there's, there's a super bug that's going to get you. There's a terrorist organization that's coming for you. The, you know, the, the malls are blowing up, the school shootings are happening. How, how the heck can we relax when all of the media coming at us is triggering this part of our brain called the amygdala to go to fight or flight to say, wow, the world isn't safe. You're not safe. You need to panic. You need to hoard calories. You need to move the blood out of your rest and digest uh, system to the, fa the, the fast twitch, get me out of this troubled situation muscles. And uh, frankly, I mean, we're just, we're overwhelming very primitive circuitry with a world that's just imbued with chaos and, and a lot of, you know, bad news, if you will. Yeah. And if you're going to keep, you know, kind of clicking on those headlines and reading that stuff, it's really hard unless you have a practice that helps offset that. You know, I don't, I don't recommend running for the mountains and hiding in a cave, but you can't do this thing called life without having a mental hygiene regimen because the, there's too many arrows flying at you. So are we actually kind of addicted to cortisol? I mean, why is it that, I mean, because the media, uh, those headlines are produced because they get eyeballs, because people click on them, yep. you know, and uh, we, we find the bad news sells better than good news. You know, any journalist knows that. And people are cynical, yes, but are we also addicted to some kind of cortisol or adrenaline response? Yeah, I think it's become part of our operating system. And if you live in a world where sympathetic nervous system overdrive is constantly running, 
uh, you're living in a part of your brain that cannot help you think ahead. You're living in a part of your brain that doesn't allow for planning, for negation of impulses, for higher moral reasoning. I mean, these things all sound like pretty good ideas in the world we live in, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you want to say no to the cheesecake? That's the prefrontal cortex. You want to say, okay, I understand that that is happening in the Middle East, but right now I'm sitting here with my daughter and uh, we're at the park. Let me, you know, go back to smiling and get out of my phone. That's the prefrontal cortex. All these things are functions of that. And our circuitry is just overwhelmingly being driven in that direction. The cortisol is a part of it. The um, amygdala is a part of it. I mean, there's, there's some complicated signaling systems that have us basically like socketed into this one channel, which is panic, right? It could be a low grade panic, but it's just always panic. And that you know, it, it triggers the immune system to be overactive with all the autoimmunity and stuff that we're seeing. Uh, it basically crushes the microbiome in the gut and, and doesn't allow for some of the, the mediation and the, the, the immunological and also the absorption that needs to happen in the gut. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many things that happen just by living in that lane. Um, cortisol is a big one, right? And cortisol will get us to basically borrow energy from tomorrow to get through today. Cause you're like, screw it. It's an emergency, you know, break into the, break into the, the granaries and you know, let's, we got to survive. Okay. That's, that's okay in a true emergency, but living that way, man, I mean, look, look around you. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think that the uh, mental health crisis that we see today, I mean, so many people are dealing with mental health problems. Um, more and more people are taking antidepressants and all sorts of medications, which may or may not actually be helpful. Do you think that um, that's one of the symptoms of this, um, this fight or flight <laughs> lifestyle? I mean, the real question is, are, are we crazy or is the world crazy, right? Uh -huh. And I think a lot of people are trying to fit into a crazy world by self-medicating and adjusting um, the way they feel to, uh, you know, get to the cubicle and park there and do their thing. I'll tell you, when I was running my medical group and I started to really understand that I was just, you know, a pawn in the insurance game, I had a, a, a really big moment, right? Where it was like, wow, I'm, I'm not happy about this. So I have a decision to make. I either need to suck it up and just say, well, this is a job job and this is the way the world is. And you know, I got to feed my family and this is what I do. Or I'm going to buck the system and do something completely, you know, chaotic and crazy and insane and like go off on my own and do all the things that I did. That was a scary moment. But at that moment, yeah. um, you know, I wasn't feeling right. Yeah. And was it me or was it the system that I was trying to fit into? Um, yeah wasn't working. You know, it's a profound commentary. Uh, Krishnamurti said, it's no measure of sanity to be well adjusted to an insane world. That's it. And, you know, I think a lot of us are in that place where we think that it, we're at fault because we're not happy. We're not satisfied. We're not well adjusted to things that some part of us say are just plain wrong. Yeah. And one of the things I love about your work, Pedram, is that you are helping people to have more peace and resiliency and, and personal wellness. And to like, you know, not, it's, it's not a time to just be at peace while your house burns down. That's it. It's also a time to like find an effective response. We don't want to live in unnecessary chaos or stress. We want to find a healthy and effective response so we can be part of something different. Amen. So we can participate in building a different kind of a world, right? And I think that starts with how we live. And ultimately, you cannot... Uh, create peace on earth if you don't have peace in your own microbiome, if you don't have peace in your own body. And so it all goes together, right? We need to change some of the conditions around us that are constantly stressing us out and freaking us out. And we also need to find a way to be more resilient and effective and present in response to those things we cannot change, right? That's it. That's um, it. And look, frankly, we live in a time where if you're listening to this and your instinct isn't to jump into an X-wing and blow a torpedo into the Death Star, you're missing it, right? Like we're being surrounded by forces that are coercing us to turn upon each other instead of realize that the system is just, um, it's bad. There's bad things happening. And so there, you have every right to be incensed, right? Like I come from the Shaolin Kung Fu tradition and the patron saint, this is worth the, the 40 second detour here, the patron saint of the Shaolin tradition was a monk named Bodhidharma, 
who had taken up residence above the temple meditating and they took notice because he was, you know, being uh, you know, mel allegedly melting rock and turning it into glass with his mind and, you know, all that sort of, you know, Eastern mysticism stuff. And they invited him in and he was just so incredibly critical of these Buddhists who were praying for world peace, but sitting there idly while the bandits came in and raped and pillaged and, and killed people in the villages. So he taught them Qigong, which brought up their energy and taught them Kung Fu, which made them the defenders of good. And they became these warrior monks that prayed for world peace and worked towards world peace, but did not allow the bad guys to just run amok and do what they were going to do with the world. Right. And so, I mean, that's, that's where I hail from. Right. It's like, I'm a nice guy, but don't mess with my kids and don't mess with the trees. Right. And so that's, it's an interesting time to be alive. I got to say that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So when we are in a state of stress, a lot of times we are so in it that we actually lose the witness place, the place that says, oh, I'm stressed, you know, and has a place outside of that reaction to actually notice and make conscious choice. And so I'm curious, it seems to me that having a witness place, like a compass that knows what north is without preference, is critical to finding a healthy and effective response and making conscious choices. Because sometimes we have fear and it's false evidence appear appearing real. And when we know that, we may still feel afraid, but we don't take it so seriously. It's like, my family isn't literally in a life or death situation. You know, my survival isn't threatened. Everything I love isn't on the line here in this moment. And then we have a choice to say, okay, but I'm feeling that way. Maybe it's an old trauma being activated. Maybe it's a pattern that I wanna shift. Maybe there's a genuine issue, but it's not as big as I'm making it out to be. How do we make it smaller? I remember actually when I was practicing Aikido uh, in my youth, uh, we were taught this notion, somebody's coming at you with a punch. And uh, we were taught to see it as there's only a three by three area you got to worry about here. You know, it's not the entire world. <laughs> mm. And there was some way to make it smaller. And then it be you become less terrified and more resilient and capable of finding a response. Just don't let that three by three thing hit you in the wrong place, you know, right, right. and it's a different frame than, oh my God, my whole world's at stake, you know? And so my, my, my question is when someone is in reactivity and they're wondering how to notice, what are the body signals you look for to say, yeah. oh yeah, I am in a state of excessive reaction right now. Yeah. So then I'll, I'll back into that afterwards by talking about why I think most people fail at this. Um, but you're going to have short, shorter breath. You're going to have elevated heart rate. You're going to have your shoulders creeping up and some tension in the back of your neck. You're going to have racing thoughts. You're going to have a generalized feeling of um, unease. And you are going to feel like there's something missing. There's something else you should be doing right now. Right. Yeah. And that's when that fight or flight reaction starts to come in. And then we start to get psychological about it. Right. We start to get, get interpretive about it. You're like, you know, maybe Ocean said something I didn't like or, you know, Betty over there. She's always mean to me. And, and so we start to extrapolate and run with narratives instead of just sensing that feeling for what it is and having the wherewithal to come back, right? Don't let it knock you off your perch. Yeah. And I think a lot of the misread of, of these meditation systems is that in the West, we've kind of brought them in as some sort of like hippy dippy substitutes for quaaludes, right? It's like, okay, so you're having a panic attack and this is how you, you know, you, you breathe out of it. Yeah, maybe kind of. The whole point is to understand 12 steps before that, if you will, and understand that you're starting to get knocked off your perch and have a meditation practice that brings you back before it's DEFCON 3, right? Before it's a three bell alarm. And so yeah. a lot of people don't have the, the mental hygiene and the resilience to know how they're feeling until it's too late and then be like, oh my God, I need a cigarette, right? Like I, right. I, I got to do something to self-medicate right now. And that's it's nice that there's play, you know, there's stretches and tapping and, you know, I could teach you a hundred things to kind of come down off that cliff, but that's not the gold standard, right? The gold standard is to constantly rewire your nervous system away from living in fight or flight so that 
you're in a peacetime economy. Look, when you're at war, all the guys are up on the, on the borders and there's no, room, there's no room in society for the opera, for music, for school books, for all the things that keep civil society going. It's the same thing with your body, your immune yeah. system, your digestion, all these wonderful foods that you're eating, you're wasting because you're so damn stressed out, you can't even assimilate them, right? Yeah. And so it's about switching over and living there and having a daily practice so that you don't get knocked off your perch. And I just, you know, I need to say that because I think a lot of people think of meditation as like the rip cord for when they're already like having a panic attack. Mm -hmm. It ain't great for that. I mean, it's better than a quaalude or a cigarette. Maybe, maybe not. Right. But if you never get there, then you never have to worry about that. Yeah. Okay. So let's go a little deeper with that then. Uh, how do we put ourselves into a state of equilibrium into a peacetime economy, as you put it, as our basic daily modus operandi? Well, a daily practice, says the monk, right? Is, you know, I don't care if it's 20 minutes a day to start, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening. Start building the circuitry. You know, in, in neurology, we say neurons that fire together, wire together. And so there's a very simple system, right? If you put the tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth and you started breathing deep, low down to your lower diaphragm, down about three fingers below your navel. And as if you had a, a balloon down there, just inflate that balloon fully on the inhale, nose, nose in, nose out, and then deflate it on the exhale and just keep it sub auditory so that you're not um, hearing yourself breathe. That's two of the three components, the tip of the tongue touching the roof of the mouth, low diaphragmatic breathing, and then slightly bend your knees because what that does is it relaxes your calves. All three of these are very powerful neurological triggers to switch you back to parasympathetic dominance. Now, you do that right now for five minutes, you're like, eh, you know what? That guy's not crazy, I feel better. You do that for five minutes, three times a day, way better. You keep doing that for a month, you will notice fundamental changes in your behavior, in your mood, in your decision-making, in your energy levels, because you're not going to that wartime economy all the time. You're not wasting resources on stress that's unnecessary. Look, I mean, if I'm walking my dogs and some like Doberman gets out and starts chasing us, that's real, right? It's like, whoa, 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 you know, there's, there's a thing happening. That's happened twice in my life. Um, I've had maybe- Even, even then- a reaction of terror is probably not optimal. In fact, I find that the more intense the stress is, the more important it is to be very calm. That's it. And very present. And the higher the stakes and the more serious the danger, the, the lower center of gravity I want to have. That's it's it. It's a time for extraordinary presence, not extraordinary freak out. Well, and you think about it, I mean, that Doberman is a predator and they feed off of fear. So right. if you're exuding fear, then, then you are prey, right? Now, now it's a thing. Now it's a chase. You, if you could calm yourself, bend your knees, breathe and be like, okay, puppy, here we are. You neutralize half those scenarios, right? And so yeah. it's, I mean, there's primitive circuitry that's driving the dog and it's also driving us. Yet because we can do math and like play with iPhones, we think that we're much beyond that right? Cognitively we are, but if we don't understand our instincts and our primitive circuitry and learn to get on top of them, then we're just getting swayed with every Facebook post or, you know, headline yeah. that comes out there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so daily practice, you're suggesting one, which is breathing, tongue on the roof of the mouth. Slightly bend your knees. to three inches, blow up that balloon under the abdomen. And just practice that. And, and what, what do you do with your mind while you're doing that? Do you want it to just notice the sensations, focus on the breath, keep it like really in the body in that way? Or what are you doing? There, there's a lot of techniques. The one that I like best, for, especially for beginners, is something called four count breathing. Um, basic yeah. Buddhist technique. Basically, as you're inhaling, you do four counts. Just count to four. At the top of the breath, hold for two. So it's one, two, three, four one, two, and then exhale, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two. And so it's basically in for four, hold for two, out for four, hold for two. And all you're doing is low diaphragmatic breathing and counting. And I guarantee you're going to lose count. 
You're going to lose track. You're going to wander. And instead of getting pissed off at yourself and feeling like a loser, understand that that's how the mind works. It's just very reactive. And so you just simply go, oh, right. Back to my four count breathing. Where the hell did I go? Right. I was thinking about yeah. my bills. I was thinking about what my wife said, my kid's future. Doesn't matter. That's what the mind does. Yeah. Just come back. Yeah. Right. And if you just keep working and focusing and in, in my tradition, we call it retroflexion. Mm-hmm. turning the light of awareness inward and just observing. Yeah. The more you do that, the better you get at it. The better you get at it, the better life starts to go. The problem is we live in this selling sugar cereal to children mentality of everything, including personal development. It's like, well, you know, I did that for 10 minutes and I didn't feel anything. Keep going, dude, right? Yeah. Work at it, work at it. And that's the problem is everyone thinks that they're supposed to like just get meditation their first time sitting there, right? Give it a month, yeah. Then we'll talk, right? Yeah. One of the things that I notice when I'm practicing, I, I do variations on what you're describing. There's obviously a lot of different specific breathing techniques, and mm-hmm. how many seconds do you do different things, and all that. But breath goes with us everywhere, and how we breathe has an extraordinary impact on our our physiology and our psychology. Mm -hmm. And oxygenating your body, which breathing deeper and more intentionally will do, you'll actually get more oxygen flow than you would just on autopilot, um, can have tremendous health benefit. It can supercharge your system. It can make you more powerful and resilient in the face of whatever life brings. The other piece, though, is that I I believe that um, if you, let's suppose, could be on autopilot to do the four seconds, two seconds, four seconds, two seconds that you just described, while your mind is totally elsewhere, you wouldn't get the nearly the same benefit that you get. And so the counting is also a tool to give the mind something to do that keeps you present in the moment, in your actual body at that moment. And the simplicity of having your mind calm on a single point of focus, essentially, uh, helps you to become the master of your mind. It becomes a tool in service to your presence rather than the dangerous scenario that happens when your mind thinks it's in charge of everything. And at least for me, uh, my mind has, does fall prey to that illusion frequently. And when it thinks it's in charge, I, th- I think minds make a great servant, but a terrible master. Hmm. And when they think they're in charge, they're actually not in touch with all of the wisdom that's in my body, that's in my spirit, that's in so many other parts of my being. And I find that my mind as a portal to bring presence into the moment helps me to become more available to respond to what life brings. Do you have a similar sensibility around that? If you think, I mean, let's ride this horse in here because what you're talking about is really the the currency of creation. And a focused mind will draw in Chinese medicine, we say the Shen or the mind is where the Chi or the energy goes. And then the matter, this material universe around us starts to assemble around it. And so you can manifest pretty much anything you want in your life with enough focus. And if you see chaos in your life, turn around and look at where your mind is going. It is this turning back inward and having the absolute control of your focus and your attention and understanding when it wavers and understanding that that's what it does. And the more you could bring it back and the more you can focus on one thing, you couple that focus with intention or willpower, you have anything you want in your life. Just be careful what you ask for. And so The people that I've been, look, I've been at this for a long time. I've had clinics. I've been writing books. I've been doing stuff. And, you know, a lot of times you're just jumping up and down, getting, you know, blue in the face, trying to like take guys, you know, focus, focus. And I realized that, you know, there's only so much I can say about diet if someone's mind is scattered because it won't matter about exercise, about sleep, about height, all of these things. What has brought me back to my roots really in all my monastic days is the currency of attention is where we are being drawn out. We're being drawn out into our devices, our phones. You know, our, our attention and our mind is being externally, our locus of control is gone because we're constantly looking for what's happening around us. And if you develop a meditation practice and you come to and you wake up to how your mind is actually scattering and bring focus to that, 
your entire life. You're, you're watering your own life garden and yeah. then you're weeding and you are being very meticulous about picking the plants that you want and life starts to work. Yeah, thank you. I wanna to jump to some of the questions we have from our participants of A Whole Life Club. There's lots of folks who um, have questions to bring to this. So Kathy said, can high levels of cortisol caused by stress be reversed when the stress stimulator is removed? And what is one action we could take every morning to prepare us to deal with life stresses? I think we've touched on that second question, although you may have another suggestion to add there. And then also curious your thought about how high levels of cortisol um, can be reversed yeah. when stress uh, stimulators removed. Well, I mean, the, first, the, the second part we have answered. I mean, listen, the answer yeah. is always going to be meditation and some form of mind-body practice for me. Whether you have a religious faith that you're with, all that, like, I, yes, please pray but also work on meditation. Those things complement each other all the time. Yeah. So yes, the second part of the question is do the work. The first part is absolutely, right? Um, the level of cortisol and um, wartime economy budgeting that happens with cortisol is diminished very drastically with mind-body practice. And I'll, and I'll explain this. There's a mechanism called NF-kappa-B, which is, it's a gene expression that, that leads to cytokine synthesis in the body. And there are plenty of studies out there showing right now that when you do a mind-body practice like Qigong or meditation, it helps activate the gene expression, which suppresses cytokine. It suppresses the inflammatory response systemically around the body. This is this is the fountain of youth in medicine, but no one's talking about it because you can't put it in a pill, right? And, and yeah. so, it, and, and everyone's been trained to think that, you know, doing the work is too hard, but I'm going to look for some supplement, some pill, some potion, or some lotion. This will absolutely radically transform the inflammatory cascades in the body, help suppress that release of cortisol because it's not needed anymore. And as you continue to do this, you will move to parasympathetic dominance and you will start to fix the economy of energy in your body. What is that? I eat food, I take those calories, I turn them into energy throughout my body, and I use that as I go. I'm not signaling my body that it's in some sort of crisis to store it as fat, right? And I'm not yeah. borrowing from tomorrow's energy today to get through some crazy situation. It's a very simple system with a lot of biochemistry, but, but, but the, the essentials of it are calm down, relax, digest your food, use that as energy and don't store it as fat and keep moving. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you, and build your muscles and use your body, right? Use your body, walk around, exercise. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting how those same principles apply to <laughs> just about every aspect of health and wellness, don't they? Yeah. Um, Bill said, have you used fasting as a means to bring your body into balance? If so, for how long, how regular and what type? Do you use solids or just water? And do you use fasting in conjunction with any other practices like prayer or meditation? I'm fasting right now. Um, so yes, absolutely. What I tend to do typically is time delayed eating. I'll have a six to eight hour eating window. So I've, you know, we had dinner at six, you know, like typically from 7, 7 p.m. to 11 a.m. I don't eat. Yeah. Um, and just water, right? Or a cup of coffee if, if it's, you know, I got young kids, right? Like you have to adjust a little bit for sleep patterns. But a cup of coffee or what, just water, it, then I'll start. I'll start with a fat or protein first. Um, I like time delayed eating because I think most people can do it. I think intermittent fasting could be challenging for people who have you know, a good percentage of the population is undiagnosed pre-diabetic at this point. And yeah. so a lot of people have very bad blood sugar variants that um, can dramatically impact mood, get you fired. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen when you're hangry. And so I think starting with time delayed eating, moving into intermittent fasting and saying, okay, you know what, I'm just going to drink water for the next three days or five days. Work with a doctor on that. That's, it's harder to do. You got to, you just got to make sure that your A1C and your, your, glucose levels don't tank and you don't go, you know, go knocking yourself out while driving. And then, yeah, I mean, look, here's where I actually um, have a bone to pick with a lot of the, the community that's doing a lot of this, you know, fasting is, are you intermittent fasting? So you look sexy and, you know, um, is it all just external reasons why you're doing this? 
Or are you using those ketones to retroflect and wake up to who you are? Are you using these incredible practices that have been designed for lower output of energy to sit your butt on a cushion and think about your life and figure out where you want to go and measure thrice and cut once, right? And so I think that uncoupling meditation and mind-body practice from fasting has uh, made it a bit less sacred. It's moved it into the mundane and it's still got tremendous health benefits and I highly recommend it for people who want to use it. But if you couple it with a spiritual practice and, and, and don't take it out of the context of saying, look, we're going to Disneyland today and I'm fasting. That sounds like a terrible idea right? There's gajillions of people and viruses and bugs and lines, and that sounds horrible. But I'm going to take Friday through Sunday and hang out at the house and take salt baths and meditate and pray and just kind of like journal and figure out where I've gone this last year and where I want to be going and talk about, you know, my mother's death or whatever it is. That's much more appropriate. It's the better use of those ketones to really turn yourself around, wake up to who you are and then move forward with a lot more clarity instead of just having six pack abs and trying to get laid. Like it just, you know what I mean? It just takes it into a, an area which I think can get dangerous. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you for that. Um, Marsha asked a question and by the way, let me say as a piece of context here, none of this is medical advice, okay? Sure. You know, uh, we're, we're sharing best insights and coaching. But obviously, as in all things, I'll say this to make sure everyone's super clear here, uh, consult with a qualified healthcare professional about your specific needs and you're ultimately responsible for the choices you make. We're just sharing our insights and ideas. That said, Marcia said, one of my friends has asthma. What can she do to help control it? Do you see any connection between stress, cortisol, adrenaline, some of the practices we're talking about today and uh, asthma? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, um, what I call these mind body practices, I, I call fuse lengtheners, right? You could have a perfectly normal day and not have an asthma attack. And then a stressful event comes up and your reaction to that event causes you to just lose it. And now all of a sudden you're, you're gasping for air, right? And so everything we've been talking about, and, and again, I just, it's hard to, it's really hard to not try to reinforce this point that if you can modulate gene expression at NF kappa B and suppress cytokine release formation in the body and bring down inflammation systemically, that is such a big deal that nobody's really talking about, right? Think about bringing inflammation down systemically. Asthma will also be much more controlled if you could bring down that cytokine release. So everything that you can do in your mind, body, compartment of your universe really needs to move over to making mind body practice your operating system. So you're living there. And then whether it's your eczema or your asthma or, you know, your panic attacks, all of those things start to come down. Now that said, what are we talking about? We're talking about lower diaphragmatic breathing. We're talking about bringing the, um, the abdominal breathing, pulling the diaphragm down. And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that you can bring more oxygen. You could oxygenate your body better by getting that extra 30, 33% of lung capacity working by using your diaphragm, using this lower abdominal breathing to get more oxygen into your system. Now, that said, go look at food allergies. I mean, if you got asthma and you don't know that you're allergic to dairy, uh, put two and two together pretty quickly, right? There's a lot of things that will trigger um, the immune system. And if you have an issue with immunity or autoimmunity or just even sensitivity to certain foods, you got to get those checked out, right? Because that would also um, help a lot, right? And if you, you know, it's like we have a saying in the martial arts, um, there's only so long you could stand in the ring without getting punched in the face, right? Like you can't just keep eating dairy and wondering why your asthma attacks are getting worse if dairy is what's cutting you, right? So figure that out, start doing mind body practice, do them together. You know, again, like we're not giving medical advice, but these are lifestyle practices, figure out what's hurting you and do things that are helping you every day, all day, every day. Yeah. Thank you. I think that, um, some percentage of people who deal with asthma may never find 
an acute trigger for it. They do eat everything perfectly. They right. aren't allergic to anything they're eating and they're living a great lifestyle. And there's still some stuff that happens because quite frankly, we live in a toxic world and it could be triggered by something to happen in your childhood. It could be genetic. There's all kinds of factors. But what we do know is that a certain percentage, perhaps a significant percentage of asthma and a lot of other health ailments are triggered by or caused by factors we have some say over. Yep. So, you know, coming back to the serenity prayer, you know, help me to accept the things I cannot change, give me the courage to change the things I can and give me the wisdom to know the difference. Mm. You know, I think this is one of those places where we do everything we can to change the things we can for the better, right? And then once we know the difference, once we've exhausted all those avenues, then we say, okay, that's a place for serenity and acceptance, you know, because that's really the best we can do. And that also can bring a certain measure of peace. And we say, okay, this is how my life is. Now, how do I find peace with it? We don't want to fight reality day in and day out because that creates stress and agitation too. But there is a time when we can change and shape reality so that we're not just at the effect of what happens to us. We're active participants. So knowing the difference sometimes takes experimentation and discovery. Yeah, and patience with yourself. I mean, you're not yeah. reversing asthma overnight. It might get better in a month or two. It might not, right? And and yeah. so there's a lot of orthorexia in our culture now, where you know everyone's like, I'm, I'm you know I'm doing everything right, and I'm still, you know, let's relax around that too, right? Let's yeah. let's relax around everything and be gentle. And the more we do so, the more we allow the body to understand that, um, that's a reality. That's an operating system. It could also function under. And that's where healing starts to happen. Yeah. Barbara said, my stress comes from a damaged nerve, which happened during hip replacement surgery. It now keeps me from striding easily and walking distances as I had done all my life. Walking was what I used to call my physical meditation. Now I tire easily and I have to work hard to keep my walking as balanced as possible to avoid hip and knee problems, which so far I've been able to avoid. Do you have any recommendations for helping to heal a damaged nerve and also for finding alternatives to walking for creating this um, meditation and also physical wellness that Barbara used to get from walking. Yeah. A couple things, Barbara. First thing I would say is uncouple your stress from the, the mentality that this is, um, an issue in your life. This is a teacher now. So your belief system that this thing is causing your stress is now putting energy around this thing and creating more of uh, an aversion to this, this thing. This like, I have this, this wound. It's like Frodo's uh, stab from uh, Lord of the Rings. Right. And it's, and it's always there. Now, look, nerves are hard to regenerate if, uh, if not impossible. That said, there are a million ways for you to uncouple your pain response with mind body practice so that you can get into a place where the the pain isn't eliciting as much uh for you there's all sorts of botanicals and cbd and all sorts of things right now that people are reporting uh really good results with and look the surgeries are getting better there's all kinds of promise coming right so let's just say walking doesn't work for you let's just say you know what that that ship has sailed fine Right. I, did, I used to do this with patients all the time. They'd be like, well, you know, I, I want to quit cigarettes. I'd be like, okay, well, what do cigarettes do for you? Well, they help me with my stress. They help me with this. Great. So we need to replace a practice there before we take away the nicotine. And so for you, the walking used to do something. What, what about Qigong? What about Tai Chi? What about float tanks? I don't like, there's no specific recommenda recommendation, Barbara, except saying, let's just say walking is off the menu right now. Let's just go to the mall, right? Let's just go shopping for different mind body techniques that can help you with your stress. Cause you need to do that, right? That don't trigger this nerve and set off a fire in your hip. That's annoying as hell. Right. And so, you know, start meditating. And if you sit and it hurts, then try standing. And if standing sucks, then try sitting or try different positions. The moral of the story is do what you got to do to create a mind-body practice to get back sitting on that perch again so that your reactivity doesn't take over. And as you get better and better at that, there's plenty of other solutions you can, you can bring to the table. Just don't feel sorry for yourself and let that narrative run, right? Don't let that narrative run, run the show. Just say, okay, this has put me in a position. This teacher is now asking me to find another way to be whole. Thank you. Beautiful. 
Um, and I would also add that, um, Barbara, you might be able to do some upper body working out, you know, join a gym and get working with the machines, get a trainer to help you guide, get started so you know how to use them and what to do that works for your body. And, um, you know, physical exercise and exertion can also be a meditation practice of sorts because it, it puts you in a state of intense focus on something other than your mind's usual chatter. And not only that, it's good for your health. That's it. Um, Becca asked about herbs, foods, and practices uh, to incorporate when starting menopause and to deal with hot flashes. Um, plenty of herbs out there. Um, it just depends. I don't like giving specific herbal recommendations, not knowing hormone levels, right? And it's, you know, you could talk about black cohosh, you could talk about red rice yeast. There's a plenty of things. And if you've already tried all those, then you know what works for you. I don't, the way Pedram operates is I don't go, okay, it's black cohosh. There's the answer. Everyone run out and eat black cohosh. I think that that is a very dangerous way of making health recommendations because everyone has different stuff. Like where's your FSH? Where's your, where's your LH? What's your estrogen? What's your progesterone? There are a lot of things that can be balanced to bring balance to the hormones, even during menopause. What I would say is modulate your stress response, clean up your diet, Check your toxicity levels, right? We're talking about microplastics. We're talking about heavy metals. We're talking about all these things that mess with hormone levels and don't allow the body to adjust accordingly. Even as, you know, the, the ovaries are doing less here and something else is going on over there. When the body has clunky, if, I, if, I, if my body is trying to get, you know, if there's a plastic bottle between me and what I'm supposed to be doing, that's a big issue. So some of the best results I've seen is from people going through detox regimens, cleaning out their pipes, cleaning up the liver, cleaning up the, on a cellular level, getting any heavy metals and toxins out and creating a very high fiber vegetable diet that allows for the body to optimally process, couple that with a mind body practice, do that for three months then you see where you're at and then you could use botanicals or, you know, I don't care, creams, whatever it is to, to adjust accordingly. But unless you do that work, you know, I think that tabloid medicine is just like, oh, here, try this dart. No, here's another dart, right? And it's yeah. just, it's uncoupled from the reality of what we know about medicine now, which is what's going on with you, right? Yeah. What's happening with you on a cellular level, where are your adrenals, where are your hormone levels specifically, and what is getting in the way of the body's optimal function. That's how functional medicine works. So yeah. don't take blanket advice from someone who says, oh, you know, what, you, what you're missing is NA, you know, NAD, C, D, whatever. That's, that's all just, that's monkey medicine. Be very, be very wary of people that are throwing around that kind of advice. Yeah. And I will add, um, Becca, that there are quite a few studies out showing dairy products to be um, crazy making on hormone systems because of course this, we're drinking the milk of a lactating mammal who has been pumped full of hormones in order to keep her producing milk for long periods of time. She's often pregnant while she's producing milk because they're trying to keep them <laughs> producing as much as possible. And uh, it's a very unnatural situation in modern dairy. And the, the result is a product that is full of a lot of hormones and because it's another mammal, they can impact our hormonal balance in all kinds of crazy ways. So that's something you should definitely think about if you're dealing with hot flashes, try cutting out the dairy and see. Actually, what made my family uh, cut out dairy originally was my mom was having really bad PMS and she was like, well, let's just give it a try and cut out the dairy. And she did that, I think I was 10 years old. And she was like, oh my God, I feel so much better. It made such mm. a difference. And mm. my dad and I actually gave up dairy as well, just to support her, even though I did love cheese at the time. And, uh, you know, I really never looked back. I then found out I had a dairy allergy myself and suddenly I could breathe through my nose. And I was like, oh my God, that's what it's like to smell things. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't even realize I was just used to it. I thought that's how life was. So anyway, dairy is worth looking at for sure. Um, and then on the, con on the other side, there are quite a few studies showing benefits from eating whole organic soy foods like edamame, tempeh, that sort of thing. Not for everybody, but for some people, it can be helpful. It's worth a try. Yeah, just, um, be, just know that you know, there's, it's a selective estrogen reuptake inhibitor. And so if you have uh, overflow of estrogen and soy may not be right for you. That's, that's why like functional medicine is like, there's different areas in metabolic pathways that need to be looked at. I mean, if you have a dairy issue or if you're having hormone overload from dairy, I mean, you know, rule number one, 
only have clean natural food that has not been enhanced in any way. I mean, this is Ocean's Tribe. You all know this. If you're eating dirty meats, what the hell are you doing? If you're having dairy from factory produced, whatever, what, you know, don't do it. Right. And then from there, once you're back to real food and your body isn't being overwhelmed by all this crap, then you start looking at places to make adjustments, right? Most functional medicine doctors will put someone through a uh, elimination provocation diet for the first three weeks before they'll even see them because 80% of the symptoms go away from just getting all the crap out. Right. And then yeah. from there, then, then we look at what the hormones are doing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Lucy said, my question is about focus. I want to study and contemplate more deeply, but just seem to flit around like a butterfly. What practices help with focus and concentration? Meditation. Here, here's the thing about meditation is, oh, you've already heard that advice, so it's not sexy. I'm going to go back to it, right? Like, I'm not trying to reinvent. It's like, oh, no, no, no. What you need to do, Lucy, is the Pedram style meditation. You know, it's all about me. Like, I've taken meditation and I put it in an app. Just understand that this has been around for thousands of years and has worked for billions of people, continues to work, and is the answer. Stay with it. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh, it's hard. Yeah. That's okay. So it's flying a helicopter. How do you get good at it? You practice. Get on a meditation cushion. Meditate, meditate, meditate. There's, there's so much cutesy, fancy stuff that everyone's trying to invent to like make a name for themselves. Just go back to meditation, please. Just trust me. Give it a month. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Catalina said, tired of losing sleep, upset stomach Sunday evenings, and a minimal conversation at work with a bully who always questions my instructions on two areas of work I lead. Our mutual supervisor is passive and non-confrontational, yet expects improvements without apparently realizing that a group effort is needed. I'm using green tea, diffusing essential oils, and listening to Calm, which is a phone app at work. These are helpful. But any advice when dealing with bullies at work? I'm still stressed. First off, you got to meditate in the mornings before you go there. So you go in with a longer fuse. And secondly, I think this is a boundaries conversation. I think that this is about having assertive boundaries and having communication support within the company. I've done a lot of corporate wellness. I've worked with thousands of companies and look, some of these things just need to be talked about. Like when I have a conflict and the ocean knows me, I'm not, you know, I, I'm a nice guy, but if something crosses me, I'm telling you. Right. And the reason is because I don't want to take that home with me. Yeah. Right. It's just like, Hey man, I, you know, whatever it is, I don't like the way you're doing this. Let's talk about this. Bring in the supervisor, bring in someone else. If we need to mediate this, I can't live by a death by a thousand cuts, right? And so it sounds like every day you go to work, you are trying to self-medicate and layer up to, you know, take a few punches on the chin because this situation sucks. If you don't fix the situation with some form of communication and better boundaries, you're going to keep walking into the same trap. And it's just, it's not good. It's like saying, oh, you know what? I keep having these crazy hangovers every morning. It's like, well, then I got to stop drinking at night, right? It's just saying, you got to fix this and adjust this so that you can have peace at work. And sometimes that comes with difficult conversations. But what we are so avoidant of is those difficult conversations because we're afraid of conflict, yet we'll take conflict home and harbor it and sit on it and write to Ocean Robbins about it, but we won't have a conversation with that person at work. That needs to change. Right. So one of the things that I've been practicing lately is this notion of win-wins in every relationship and every professional negotiation. I'm only ultimately interested in something that's a win for me and a win for whoever I'm interacting with. And ultimately, I can't always take responsibility for knowing what their win is, because that's their job. But I can know that that's the spirit I'm approaching things with, which means that I would, a deal is only a good deal if it's actually good for all involved. If there's somebody who's losing, it creates a mess that's got to be cleaned up later. And so um, that kind of cuts to a really central place, which is how do we stand passionately for things we want, things that we're working towards? And recognize that sometimes certain things will happen in life that help us advance our goals. And other times things will happen in life that do not. And yet we want to stay detached. And yet we want to stay passionate and perhaps even attached to our conviction, to our values, to our goals in life. Do you have any guidance to share on this sort of razor's edge crucible of 
attachment and non-attachment, passion and conviction with release and surrender and how you find your center in it all? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with letting go of trying to be a people pleaser. And I think a lot of people, especially in like the spiritual communities or the healthy communities, everyone's, you know, it's like, I'm a nice person, right? And nice people don't do that. And I think that's also a misread of where your wins are. Like a lot of people will let go of their own wins for long enough. And then they come back and they just viciously attack because they're tired of being abused and overrun. Right. Yeah. And I think that good, healthy boundaries and good communication go a long way. And, you know, whatever it is, it's like, hey, you know what, this is what we need out of this. And, um, you know, this is, this is where I stand on this deal. If that works for you, great. If that doesn't work for you, that's fine. I love you and I respect you, but we just, you know, we can't do this together. And I think uh, a lot of people are very meek in that and not asserting and standing up for themselves. And eventually that builds up a lot of resentment towards others and resentment towards life and frustration in life. And then it gets you to do aberrant things, whether it's drinking, whether it's being a jerk and snapping or whatever it is, you just can't swallow that poison on a daily basis. And so I, you know, I think effective communication comes with knowing what you want and communicating that in a way that doesn't sound selfish, but sounds assertive for oneself. Right? Like, hey, this is what I need out of this. What do you need out of this? And then you either find a win-win or you agree to disagree and walk away. That's fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not everything has to work out, but everyone should win. I like win, win, win. Like for me, anything I do is a win for the parties involved, also a win for the planet. And if mm -hmm. one of those three loses, I'm out because I don't want to contribute to that, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's just the operating system I run everything through. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, beautiful. Well, we're nearing the end of our time here. Uh, anything else you want to add to this conversation or, or, or recap? Yeah, I mean, I think the moral of the story is, folks, talk is cheap. Do the work. Everyone likes to talk about stress management and mind-body practices and all these things. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I heard, you know, Qigong is a thing. Or mind-body, have you tried this app? It's talk is cheap. Get on a cushion, do the work. And tomorrow, do it again and again and again. It's like flossing your teeth. You just keep doing it because you know it's the right thing. And eventually, the gains start to show themselves and then you would never look back. But unless you do the work, you will never know what meditation is. It sounds so cool. I, you know, I just told you that there's studies that prove that meditation and mind-body practice are the fountain of youth and will absolutely radically transform everything that happens with your cytokine synthesis in your body and change your life. What, what else? I mean, okay, are you going to meditate or not? Right? It's like, this is it. Are you going to do yeah. it or not? And that's the problem we're having with our culture is we all are waiting for the next bit of information that changes us instead yeah. of realizing that it's our action. The next step we take individually that will transform our lives, not something from the outside coming in and changing me. I'm not waiting for the next podcast that like I just hadn't heard of that's going to fundamentally radically transform everything in my life. Yeah. It's on me, which yeah. means I have to do it. Start meditating. All right. So let's do it right now. Would you walk us through about one minute? Just guide us for a second sure. so we can all do this together. If you're, if you're seated, you're fine because your, your calves are already um, relaxed. If you're standing, just bend your knees and relax your calves a little bit. Tuck your pelvis up a little bit so that as you do your lower diaphragmatic breathing, you can feel the movement of your pelvis as your, as your diaphragm starts to pull down. A lot of us are really stuck there and, and many of you won't even feel this for a minute, right? Because you just got to keep practicing until you open up that real estate. Tip of the tongue, touching the roof of the mouth, blowing up that imaginary balloon in your lower abdomen. Inflate it fully as you count to four. Count to yourself, obviously, and then hold for the count of two. And then release for the count of four. and hold for the count of two. Breathing and counting, counting and breathing. You could close your eyes if you can. If you're driving your car, just keep doing this breath work while keeping your eyes open, right? And just see if you could just run this 
in the background of your operating system of your mind, you spend 10, 15, 20 minutes a day doing it intently with your eyes closed. And then every chance you get, remember to do it while moving around in your world, while being the person you're pretending to be, instead drill down and find the person you truly are. Come from that place of peace, come from that place of serenity. You make better decisions. Your body loves you for it. The fields are being watered. The troops come back from the borders. There's school books, there's roads, there's healthcare come back to the peacetime economy, live in the peacetime economy, and then everything you do reflects it. The world around us becomes less chaotic because we're less chaotic. Hmm. Thank you. It's beautiful. And so it is. And so it is. So peace to you. Dear Pedram, peace to you, everybody watching and joining us right now. Peace in your body, peace in your heart, peace in your mind, peace in your spirit, peace in your family, peace in your home, peace in your community, peace, peace in your place of work, peace in your place of worship, peace in your nation, peace on your planet. Let there be peace on earth. Let it begin with me. Thank you so much for joining us in this action hour. Pedram, it's been great to share this time with you. And for awesome. everybody with us, thank you for practicing peace in your body, mind, heart, and spirit. Blessings to you. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for Whole Life Club. Click the link to find out more and to join in now.